Hello and welcome to Embedded. I am Elicia White here with Christopher White. This week our guest is Alvaro Prieto and we'll be talking about cheese, the weather, robots. Who knows really? <laughs> hey Alvaro, how's it going? Hello. Hi, it's 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 going well. I, I, I just have to say this is very weird because I usually listen to the podcast at like 2x speed and that <laughs> intro was so slow. <laughs> so slow. <laughs> Well, we'll try. We'll try to. We'll try to match two X during lightning round. How's that? Yeah, that we'll ease you into it, and then we'll slow down. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, that just caught me off guard because when we were speaking earlier, it was normal, <laughs> and then the intro is something I hear a lot, and that was just wrong. <laughs> uh, for people who haven't heard you be on the show in the past, could you give us an introduction? Uh, I'm Alvaro. I am a electrical and firmer engineer. And I like cheese. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that, 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 that about covers the, the basics. Um, okay, we'll, we'll get into more details. Probably <laughs> not just cheese, but maybe some other things. I like other things as well, yes. Are you ready for lightning round? Yeah, absolutely. Favorite obsolete technology? Obsolete? Oh, shoot. Okay, I'm not ready for lightning round. I take that back. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, um, obsolete, but if it was obsolete, I would, uh, uh phone calls. Favorite kind of cheese? Uh, Latour. Describe it. Well, that's not a kind, that's a specific cheese, but. What, what, what makes it good? Uh, it's, it's three different kinds of milk. So you got, uh, cow, sheep, and goats milk, and it's kind of a soft spreadable cheese and it's amazing. So it's Tres Leches cheese. <laughs> it's a good cake. Favorite kind of weather? Um, cold and sunny. Favorite kind of robot? A working robot. For Swiss cheese, what happens to the hole when the cheese is gone? Whoa! Oh, gosh. <laughs> what happens to the hole when the cheese is gone? Um, it, it re-enters the the universe. I don't know the cosmos. <laughs> it goes back to where it came from. Where did it come from? Would you bring back the dinosaurs? Sure. Which ones? All of them. But, um, okay, that, I would, if I were to bring all of them back, I would bring dinosaurs from specific periods in separate areas. I wouldn't want to mix them because I know that not all the dinosaurs live together. So, yeah. So we'll have different of the Jurassic Park islands for each different period. Okay. Do you have a tip everyone should know? Um... Don't give up. <laughs> just just try again later. <laughs> when <yeah. laughs> try again later. <laughs> 404. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, so you have been doing cheese and there's water robotics involved in jobs and there's some electrical things with a weather station. But first, you you not only are cheating on us with another podcast, you started your own <laughs> podcast. I, I don't cheat, no. Um, I've, I've only been in a few others, but uh, I think this was my first podcast that I was on, uh, 2015. So, you know, I'm just saying. But but yeah, I, I do have uh, the unnamed reverse engineering podcast with, uh, with Jen, uh, who's also been on probably one of the first podcasts, I guess, right? Oh, many of the first podcasts. Yeah. What's the show about? Oh, reverse engineering. We uh, talk to people that are much smarter than us <laughs> about reverse engineering topics and just kind of taking things apart. And um, not just hardware, but a lot of it is hardware taken apart, like reverse engineering silicon, uh, web protocols, like all, all sorts of stuff. Um, the, the most recent ones we talk to folks who make the tools for reverse engineering. So um, the open source ones or some commercial ones, but but yeah, we, we kind of talk all things reverse engineering. Okay, what's a recent one that you're super happy about? Oh, uh, Sammy Campcar uh, came on and and did one about the the firewall. Uh, what was what was it called? Uh, but basically, you go to a website and it can open up any port on your firewall from mm. the outside, which is pretty neat. Um, <laughs> neat. Matt, yeah. slipstreaming? 
Slipstream, yes, Nat sleep, Slipstreaming. Yeah, he, he, he came on to talk about it like a little bit after he published it. And since it's gotten a lot scarier, uh, like <laughs> other people figured out ways to, to do more things with it. Um, yeah, so that was fun. And um, I've I also gotten to talk to some of my, I won't say childhood, but uh, when I was younger, heroes uh, of uh, security, computer security, or like Joe Grand uh, was, was a really fun one. Or I talked to uh, this one person, his handle was Major Malfunction, who I saw at DEF CON in Vegas back in 2006 when I was 18. And I saw a talk by this person and it was really cool about hacking uh, Mac stripes. So and on train tickets, on credit cards, all that stuff. And and I sent him an email uh, and he replied. And back then I was like, oh, this is super cool. This person actually is helping me out. And many years later at hardware.io, which was a hardware kind of uh, security conference here in the Bay Area, he happened to be there and I didn't realize because he was going by his real name, but I got to interview him for the podcast, which was pretty cool. How far were you into the podcast before you realized you knew this person? Oh no, no, I, I, I knew. I no, <laughs> thankfully, I, I did know the uh, when we started the podcast. But I was in the conference already, and and then somebody mentioned the name. I was like, wait a second, like that's this person, and then I, I went and uh, asked him if he <laughs> if he could be on the show. Cool. What have you learned from the show that, you know, you didn't really expect to learn? Whoa. Uh, yeah, I don't think about these things. We, <laughs> I just like to talk to people and it's fun. But um, what have I learned? I've learned there's way too much fun things and not enough time to do them. Like, uh, I, I learned about all these really cool technologies and, and techniques people use for, for kind of taking things apart or, or, or learning about things. And I always want to try them, but but there's never enough time, and and just hearing the the stories of how people ended up and like figuring things out is always uh, a ton of fun. And I I'm, I'm blanking out, but if I look at the list of episodes, I could tell you some really cool things that I've learned. It's hard to do it on on the spot, you on know? the fly, right? Yeah. Okay, so what are you doing for work these days? I, I am uh, doing firmware again, finally, after kind of doing all sorts of other things. But I'm, I'm doing firmware for ocean uh, remote sensing buoys. <laughs> what else can you tell us about it? Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. So it's a company called SoFar Ocean. And folks might know um, the name... Uh, open ROV, which was yes. kind of a, I don't know if it was a Kickstarter or something back in the day that uh, they, they built like an un, uh, open source underwater kind of rover or drone or whatever you want to call it. And then that company later on merged with another company called Spoondrift Technologies, and then they formed Sofar Ocean. And right now I am working on the next generation of kind of remote sensing buoys. And these are buoys that you... Well, we have a couple one, uh, a couple types, but you basically throw them in the ocean, and they just float in the middle of nowhere and measure like sea surface temperatures and wave heights and other things, and then send the data back over satellite. But you can also buy them if you're an individual or company for research and deploy them kind of off the coast. Or uh, there's a company that's deploying them to monitor coral reef water temperatures and stuff, and then you can get the data back over um, satellite. I mean, through our API or whatnot. But yeah, I was going to ask who, who the typical client was. Like, is it like NOAA or private companies? Or there's yeah, there's there's different ones, right? So so there's there's private companies, and so we we sell the buoys themselves that you can put you know somewhere uh, wherever you need <laughs> to get the data, and and like you can moor them or put them in a static location. Then we also have our own that are just drifting across the ocean. That's why spoon drift back in the day. And those we can just sell the data. But another thing we're doing is using that data ourselves to create uh, much more accurate uh, weather models. So NOAA releases their own, and then we can augment it because we have data points that are all over the place. And we use that to do kind of uh, ship routing services. Oh, okay. Can you look for tidal waves? Uh, I think the science people could answer that. I don't know. Um, 
hopefully. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but 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 there's a lot of um, kind of grants like with the I don't know who who does them, but but to do research right uh, of these kinds of things. So I, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what I can talk about, and what I can't. But but the they they are doing kind of wave measurements, and I don't know if if it's sensitive enough to just catch the one rogue wave kind of thing. Hmm. Is that what you mean? Yeah. I, I wonder. I, I would have to ask. And actually, the the CTO has been on the show before, um, back when he was working at a baby monitoring startup, I think. Yeah, right? Evan, Evan Shapiro. Shapiro. We talked about baby monitoring, and I think and using poker. machine learning to win at poker. Yeah. It was a weird show. <laughs> <laughs> but it was pretty cool. Well, yeah, he, he's he's a CTO at SoFar now. Is there anything about engineering for the ocean that people don't necessarily realize right off? I mean, I think, I hope most people realize that the ocean is incredibly harsh in all sorts of ways. Um, like salt water will corrode everything, but that's not the worst part. Then critters, all sorts of things just start growing on every surface you can imagine and starts growing and growing and growing and then kind of takes over it. Um, you can't get your things back because they're in the middle of the ocean and you know debugging can be exciting when you can never get it back. So, so there, there's a lot of uh, interesting <laughs> problems. Yeah, but you don't have to worry about rock slides or you know hard things running into it, except for maybe. I, I guess a boat shipping. could hit it. But yeah, <laughs> icebergs. I hopefully it's coming slow enough that it no, I think it would be like... more of a. <laughs> Is there any reason why that was the job you took? Uh, well, so. Um, previously, so I, l- l- let me, let me recap what's happened since I was last on here. Um, I was here right after I quit Apple and I think it was a planet labs, right? Um, maybe. Yes. Or, um, yes. Well, that was the first time I was on. So, so I joined planet labs and like six months later I quit, uh, cause it, <laughs> it wasn't a great fit. And, and then I took my, uh, what I call my self-funded sabbatical. Uh, it was originally supposed to be like a month or two just to kind of recap, like get my act together and find a job, but then it was too much fun. So I just started traveling and meeting up with friends, that kind of thing. And then I joined uh, a company called Verily, which used to be Google Life Sciences with, uh, you know, Ben Cross and I was there and um, it, it was a lot of fun. And I was there for almost a couple of years. And then I s- kind of did a switcheroo to Project Loon, which was also within Alphabet. So it was kind of like switching jobs within the same company. I, it wasn't, it was different companies, but it was all still under Alphabet. So I went to Project Loon. And then I was there doing ground station stuff for the balloons. And last year in uh, March, I had the brilliant idea of quitting my job to go traveling. I I didn't have that idea in March, but my last day was like March 4th or something. Um, So I quit my job and like two weeks later, I was locked down in my apartment. (laughs) So that didn't work out as expected. And, you know, that's like for everyone else as well. And so, yeah, I didn't really have a job. I was just kind of not doing anything, working on projects at home, watching lots of movies, walking around the hills. <laughs> and and then uh, a recruiter from so far reached out and it seemed like a really interesting project. And for me, the the my favorite part was the chance to work on something from scratch because I'm working on the next generation of the buoy and it was uh, full redesign. So do the processor selection, start the firmware, I don't want to say from scratch, but a lot of it from scratch because it's an entirely different system. Um, we, you know, Some of the algorithms will port over, but, but the underlying system is totally different. So, so it was a chance for me to kind of do the whole thing. And you know, I, I got to play with free RTOS. I, I, well, I ended up choosing free RTOS, but I, I you know, had to choose like uh, which RTOS we want to use. Do we want to use an RTOS? Which tool chain do we want to use? Um, and, and then going through the whole process of like writing the drivers, optimizing power consumption, uh, debugging, all sorts of different things. So it was a really fun uh, <laughs> puzzle, if you want to call it problem f- for me, that I've never done the entire or never owned that, that entire thing. I usually come into a project that's already started and somebody already made all of these decisions. And then 
I just have to live with them. And this was an opportunity to do that. And also, it's really cool that we're doing remote ocean measurements and stuff. Like, I, I like both the company and the opportunity. That is a, the most, it, it can be really fun to come into a company and, and be able to kind of start things from scratch because you, you know the mistakes people have made before. So you feel mm-hmm. like you can kind of skip some of those and you know what things are important, what aren't. Yeah, and I'm sure I'll make some my, myself, right? But, right, but right. at least <laughs> I can I can not do what I've had other people and be like, oh, this is stupid. And, and then I don't want to do that. Uh, so, so now I have a chance not to do that. I've noticed that you've worked at... Uh, Space companies and uh, air companies and land, or nope, and, and and ocean companies. But but uh, you you need to do one more company to uh, wait to own all kinds um, of things. Do you, do you need an ag tech company? Is a, that what a you're land saying? Land company of some kind. Oh, land mining, um, mining, mining or ag tech. Ag tech. I've worked in trains before. Uh, Technically, that's, that's that's okay. Wait a minute. Worked that's in our, trains? Does that mean you were working on, while no, well, on so the trains? The trains went on the things that I worked on. So my my first <laughs> okay. internship in college was at a company called Railcom, and they did remote track switching equipment. So I I was writing the code that uh, communicated over the radio and actually moved these giant uh, track switches, like did the the yeah, actuation, and somehow my code is made it out to like lots of CSX train yards. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was a fun one. So I have worked, I guess, in sort of. It's like the embedded version of an EGOT, right? Air, land, sea, <laughs> space. <laughs> Got to catch them all. I haven't done underground stuff, I guess. Um, seismic. I don't know what I would do. Well, I, we just saw yeah. Godzilla. So there are those tunnels that go to the center of the earth. So it's oh, probably some yeah, stuff you that, can do there. <laughs> Godzilla versus, Hong, versus King Kong. And versus Hong Kong, actually. I have Kong, not seen actually. that one. I've seen, I've seen the other ones. Okay, so work aside, because we're not quite sure what details I can ask you about that. Um, oh, you can ask. I just don't know if I can answer. <laughs> right. I get boring real quick. Oh, it's just going to be for fun for Chris during editing, right? We can talk whatever. It's great. I'm not going to get in trouble if I don't edit it out. <laughs> Jeez. You've been. <laughs> Let's go somewhere where there's cheese. <laughs> Let's go somewhere where there's cheese. Um, That's a so good place. I guess I guess uh, we. I should have asked him if the moon was made of Wensleydale. Wasn't it Stilton? I don't know. Anyway, you've been making cheese. Um, yes. Do you know that you can buy that in stores? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard. No, I, I do buy it in stores uh, because they have really tasty versions that, that I can't make yet. Take us through what making cheese is all about. Like, I don't really understand. Like, I, the, the most I've I've seen about making cheese is when I, I tuned into your your short Instagram live broadcast of making bread, <laughs> which, which was interesting. It was very interesting. And Sorry, so yes. It, it seems I like it's a lot that. of biochemistry. So, c- yes. can you explain what cheese is and why I never want to eat it again after hearing you tell me what it is? <laughs> Well, okay. I, I will tell you about a, a specific type of cheese that I am currently making. I, I can say a couple, but but yeah, basically the the one that you saw me making in my Instagram live, the one and only time I've done that, uh, would feature my parents even, uh, <laughs> which is great. But I, you basically get your your the ingredients that you need are basically milk and heavy cream. If if you know if if your milk isn't fatty enough. But basically, you have your 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 dairy, your your milk. So so I got a bunch of milk. Then you have cultures you introduce. So this is bacterial culture, and then also molds, and your coagulant, which is rennet. And then depending which milk you use, you might add citric acid as well, just to play with the pH. I think. But what you do is you warm up the milk. You add the cultures. You let them kind of rehydrate because you you buy them <laughs> powdered farm from the the web of cheese, and then you add the rennet, which will coagulate it, and then you kind of let it sit, and you have now kind of a jello, a big jello thing of milk, and that's what you call your curds. And so you cut it, you cut it all up, chop it all up into smaller pieces, and, and you they stir squeak, it up. Right? They squeak? Like not in this case. Uh, the, the, you, you're probably thinking of the cheddar ones. And those, I believe they they wash them with hot water after this step. 
they, they do something else to it. It depends on the cheese. You, you do different things once the, the curds are set. Um, but for brie, it's a soft cheese. After the curds are set, you cut it up and then you put them in these molds. And they're kind of like, imagine a cup, but it's sort of a strainer. So it lets the liquid out in the form of the whey. Uh, W-H-E-Y, <laughs> the whey. And it kind of, the, the whey kind of falls out. Um, and then you, you and then flip you take the it to someone times. and you say, this is the way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is the way of the cheese. Now, I don't know why that reminded me of Star Wars, but. A Mandalorian. Um, oh, right. Yes. That's, <laughs> that is the way. Uh, that, <laughs> I just watched it last weekend for the first time. But, uh, so, so, so you have, you have the cheese curds, you put them in these molds, the way kind of falls out and, and, or drains out. That's a better more technical term. You turn it a couple times, and this is over the course of hours. So you might do 12 hours, leave it overnight, uh, uh, kind of a room temperature while while the basically the, the, the cheese forms can hold themselves up without the, the molds. And then you take them out of the molds and you put them in your cheese cave or aging container, which for me is a plastic uh, a Tupperware box or Tupperware container inside of a small fridge. And that is where the mold grows. So if you've ever had brie, it has this white rind. That's actually mold. And if you see it grow, and I can actually share, I have a little time lapse that I took of the mold growing. It's just kind of fuzzy, cotton-like mold that grows out. And the roots, the roots of that mold are what actually age the the, the cheese. That's what's actually changing the, the cheese from just, milk flavor to whatever <laughs> different flavors you're going to get. So after about 10 days or so, you're kind of turning it every day just so the mold doesn't grow into the surface that it's sitting on. Just turn it every day and then you can wrap it. And that's when the rind for the brie gets smooth. And, and that's why you don't eat a brie that's kind of like fuzzy, but it's smooth. So you wrap it and then you age it for another like four to six weeks, depending on the temperature. And then you have cheese or brie cheese. Or camembert or something like that. Okay, setting aside what rennet is made out of, and that there was a lot of mold in this story, which I thought wasn't what you wanted on cheese. Well, it depends. And and actually, um, most rennet in use nowadays is not animal-based. Oh, really? Um, yes. The oh, so, so there's a few different kinds. And yes, originally rennet is made from like, I don't know, the, the, the inside of the stomach of a baby cow or something. Um, some like that. It's it's animal parts. So technically, <laughs> like, cheese isn't vegan uh, or vegetarian. It's definitely but, not vegan. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, not vegan. vegan. Well, the, the, there is cashew. Although we'll come the, back to uh, that. I'm, I'm not going to go into that. But <laughs> but uh, now there is microbial rennet. And then there's also, so, so they actually use, um, I forget which critter. I don't know if it's a, a, a yeast or a bacteria or something or, or a virus to actually make the same proteins that are in regular rennet um, without using the animal. <laughs> so I guess they got the original, like right. the, the, um, the specifications, the user manual. They basically made a copy of that. Uh, I think it's protein, but whatever chemical composition, they're able to reproduce it now without using the animals. And most, I think it's over like 60% or 90%, something crazy in the US of commercial cheeses actually don't use animal rennet anymore. If you go to like France and you go with the old school diehards, they're going to tell you that it makes a big difference and you got to use the old school stuff, but it doesn't seem to be the case for most places. Okay, that's incorrect. But I still don't know where the electronics comes into this picture or into this cheese as the case may be. What electronics? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> this... I I have a problem. Yeah, I. <laughs> <laughs> Is it an electronic well, I, I just problem love making or a cheese things, right? problem or a personal problem? And I, I do have a cheese problem that too, but but I have other problems. But I love I love making things. And so, so whenever I I'm doing something at work, I'll still come home and still work on electronics or firmware or software or whatever be, because it's fun. And I find excuses to work on these side projects. Um, in, in, in ways that teach me something I don't know yet. So, I don't know, this was 2017 maybe, I started thinking about making cheese and I went 
uh, I went in, uh, into it with the perspective of being a, an engineer, and I started uh, designing like a circuit board with temperature and humidity sensors and like relay outputs, so I could turn the fridge on and off to control the temperature. And then I had another relay to control a little motor motor for a water pump, so I could introduce humidity. I had no idea what I was actually going to need, but I kind of just started making circuit boards because why not? And then I actually started making cheese and found out... Engineer it first. Figure out what you need later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just like, I'm just going to do all the things. And and I need to do this. You know, I, I wanted to play with the STM32, I don't know, F0 or uh, so, some microcontroller, right? And so, so I, I wrote some code. I, I got to work with USB and that thing. And then later I knew, that I, I realized that I don't need to control this so much. Um, I, <laughs> I just need to measure it. So I started making my circuit board smaller, and uh, just because I didn't, I don't need a fan controller. I don't need a relay controller for the fridge. So I made it smaller. And then somebody, I don't know if it was Wendell from Evil Mad Scientist, or someone recommended. It's like, hey, what if your your boards were shaped like like cheese? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? So so then uh, that's a great idea. So then these sensor boards themselves that that had a temperature humidity sensor. I started making them like little wedge shaped, like pizza slice or cheese shaped. But these were Oshpark boards, so they were purple. So then I found out how, to, how can I make these yellow? And then I made <laughs> yellow cheese shaped <laughs> cheese temperature and humidity monitors. And, and then I kept going because why not? Because there's a lot of wires. I thought, why not make this wireless? Why not make this Bluetooth? So I, I made these kind of standalone little cheese wedges and they have an NRF52 a little 2032 coin cell battery and the sensor and Bluetooth. So, so now I've learned, you know, how to do weird shape circuit boards. I've, I've learned about like STM32. So I've learned about NRF 52s. I decided to teach myself minute the operating system for the RTOS for, for playing with Bluetooth. And then I wanted to learn low power design, right? Like how low can I go? And then I was able to get it to like one to two microamps average current, and I'm transmitting every minute the temperature and humidity, which I thought was pretty good. Uh, but it took a lot of work to get there. Uh, and then, yeah, so, so these are just excuses to to learn things and, you know, uh, monitor the cheese. So when you have Bluetooth on a wedge-shaped board, does that make it blue cheese? Oh, no. <laughs> no, it's yellow. I'm not going to acknowledge that. Did you put extra <laughs> large vias or or extra large drilled holes through the board so that it could look like Swiss cheese? I thought about it, but I didn't. I I I I think the most I would do is silk like weird silk screen. The main problem is the battery. The CR 22, 2032 is I guess I could probably get away with some holes, but the the bottom is mostly just battery. So you can't really see much in the top's components. <laughs> so there's not a lot of room to cut out uh, of any um, shape that would look good, I guess. Do you have all this online? Can somebody else make your cheese board? It's on GitHub. It's not like, I don't have like a page describing it all, but yeah, it's all, all my stuff is open hardware, open source, and and I have pictures. I've also done, a, I had a crowd supply teardown. I gave a talk about it couple of years, or, well, okay, no, maybe more than a couple of years ago, but all, all of the don't do this uh, lessons learned, so all the mistakes I made, I, I made a talk about that and how I ended up where, where I was at the time. So you're sending temperature and humidity data every minute. Yeah. While your cheese is being, what's the word here? While the cheese Slowly is digested fermenting, by the forming, uh, while your cheese is cheesing. Mushrooms? Uh, <laughs> The mushrooms. Sure. Uh, are, are you sitting here watching a big display and, and, and seeing if there's, you know, an error or something? How, how do you use this? Yeah, I have this? a projector on the wall with the live... No, no. Uh, <laughs> I, have alerts coming I, into your phone, emergency cheese humidity. I get text range. messages every three minutes. Um, no, so I don't really look at it very much, to be honest. So <laughs> what I... Uh, so the, the, the boards transmit temperature humidity... And right now it goes to a Raspberry Pi that just saves them to an SQLite database. And then I do have a web interface I could use, but I don't really look at it unless something's wrong. So, so I'll, I'll check it every few days just to make sure that the temperatures are what they're supposed to be and the humidities aren't crazy. 
But the, the main goal right now for me, since I'm able to make it without <laughs> the sensors uh, checking them too much, is if something goes horribly wrong, I have kind of the history, the data to go back and see like what happened. Uh, or if something goes very right, I'll have this as an example of you know what environment it was in. So, so it's mostly kind of a backup of <laughs> if something goes wrong right now, and just the, the current the, the current measurements. When you started out making cheese, you you started out making possibly over engineered sensors. Yes, and then you got more into the actual product. And now you're barely monitoring them unless something happens. Yeah. <laughs> Do you draw any conclusions yeah. from that? I mean, I, the, the, the monitoring was always the excuse, right? It was like about people the have journey. Been making cheese. But was it about Sorry? the cheese or was it about the electronics? That's what I'm trying to get to the heart of. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was about both, uh, really. The. Uh, they, they kind of drove each other, right? Like sometimes the, the cheese, the, there was like a year and a half where the cheese was failing repeatedly. Like we, we could, couldn't get it right. And so I worked more on the sensors because that was actually working. And, and then eventually the cheese started working again. So this year I've been making lots and lots of cheese, but I haven't che- done anything with the sensor. I did change the, from SQLite, I, I'm playing with InfluxDB, which is a different type of uh, database, just because why not? Because it's fun. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it kind of goes back and forth and, and, and like I said, it's just an excuse to, to learn new things. Do you think your adventures with your cheese board helped you get your current job? What with the whole monitoring and low power part? Yeah. So <laughs> the, uh, so far has a pretty neat interview process where you do your regular kind of interviews and I guess this were all remote, but. Uh, one of the the last steps of the interview process is to do a presentation to the entire company. Uh, it's a very small company, but do a presentation to anyone who wants to show up about anything you're passionate about. So they, they don't tell you what to give a talk on. And so I, I did like a five minute, how do you make cheese? And then I went on after about how I made all my cheese boards, because why not? And then, and then I talked about my weather station after, and, and these were all very relevant projects to to a remote weather measuring company. So I don't know if, if they, that's the reason I got it, but I, I think they helped. It was more, did the skill building that you were attempting succeed in getting you a new job? Oh, absolutely. Yes, like 100%. And, and, and this has been kind of historical. Like I, th- this has helped me get jobs in the past as well. Um, like w- when I first showed up for my interview at Apple, it was for firm engineering, but I brought some circuit boards I made for fun just to play with. And, and, and they weren't super relevant to the writing code part of it, but they were like, okay, that's cool. And then that also means that you can know your way around hardware. And, and as you, as you both know, if you're a firm engineer that works with hardware, if you can, if you're comfortable with hardware, that's a lot more debugging you can do, right? If, if, if something's wrong, you don't just go hand the board to the hardware engineer and say it's not working. You can actually dive in and and like pull out the oscilloscope logic analyzer and, and do some more debugging without needing anyone else's help. And, and showing up with my hobby projects that were hardware related for a firmware engineering interview was uh, impressive to them because it's like, oh, okay, you, you know, you you know more than more than that. And same, you know, with, with Verily, you know, I, I showed up and, and I had these other side projects that were related to the job, but not specifically what I was wanting to, to go do. So, so I, I, I think it absolutely has helped. <laughs> Long story short. Do you consider it a portfolio or are you just taking random projects to interviews? Do, do you do the formal thing? No, I, I just do it for myself, uh, basically for my own, <laughs> oh, one of my high school teachers was my personal edification. And yeah, just uh, I do it because I think it's fun and I want to learn these things. For, for example, with uh, some of the cheese projects and some of the kind of in-between projects, I wanted to learn surface mount technology, right? And uh, I was I had done surface mount before, but with a soldering iron, but I wanted to do reflow. So, so I my for my personal projects... 
I started getting stencils made and I got some solder paste and I got a little reflow oven. And one of my, my second job at Verily was doing a lot of hardware prototyping and, and I was doing all that myself and, and I got it because they knew that I could do it. And I, it, they knew because I had my little side projects that I'd been doing just for myself, but I didn't go and say, oh, I should learn how to do surface mount, solder paste, whatever stuff. And because it was going to help me get a job, um, I could have done that, but that was not my primary driver, I guess. It's mostly my own uh, curiosity. Do you have any tips for people who don't have the energy, motivation, <laughs> ambition to to be able to do both work and projects at home? I mean, it, that's a tough one, right? Because I am that crazy person that, that, that likes this so much that does it for fun as well as for work. But if I'm going to be perfectly honest, I don't always do the exact same thing at work and at home. Like whenever my job is more firmware related, I might do my hobby projects more hardware or, or something else, right? If, if I'm doing electronics at work, I might go home and do more software and firmware. I This year I've been doing a lot more mechanical. I got myself a 3D printer. I've been learning like FreeCAD, just doing kind of 3D modeling stuff. So so that's kind of a way to so your brain doesn't get totally tired. But as far as making time, anything like that, I just, you know, the, the only thing, and I'm, I'm sure y'all have told people before, is you just need a project, right? You need something that you're excited about, and then you learn the tools you need to do it. Um, so if, it, and in this case for me, it was like making cheese, right? That, like, I thought that was, that was cool. And I was like, I can make a tool to make my cheese making uh, easier or something. And then that was my excuse. And that's what kind of got me motivated to, to do it. But I, how to get that motivation is, is kind of a hard, hard question to, to, to answer. Yeah, I think if we could bottle that, we could really make a lot of money. Yeah, well, then we don't have to work anymore, right? <laughs> but also, but I, we I still don't... want to because of the bottling. Well, because yeah, we're <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's so true. But uh, but yeah, no, and, and this year or the past year and a half, I, I would say actually has been not very productive for me. Just. Um, even though I do have all these side projects and it looks like I do a lot of stuff, I haven't. I, I, I've been trying to stay off the computer because <laughs> I have a lot of a repetitive stra stra strain injuries and stuff. So so I, I've been trying to find other hobbies, which is really hard to do without using your hands. So so to say, <laughs> like, so even if you do this for like a few hours a week, or it's still like something, I guess. There is some value to realizing that you didn't do this all in the last five months. No, no, this has been very long, long term. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, that's why it, it, I, I mentioned earlier that one of my talks was all the things I did wrong. Because you see, yeah, a lot of video, uh, a lot of YouTube videos, blog posts, you see those amazing projects that are super intricate. And then it looks like they just did them really fast. And some people do work really fast, but but they don't you don't get the perspective of, of, you know, all the hours that were put in, all the suffering, the pain and suffering of things not working. And yeah, uh, like, for example, the cheese thing, I, I think I started in 2017. So, so it's been like four or some years on and off uh, just doing these things a little bit at a time. But it's never been, I have to put in 20 hour weeks in addition to my job for the next four no, months. No, absolutely not. If, if <laughs> you can look at, uh, I watch a lot of movies. So, so if, if you just add up the, the amount of time I spent watching movies, you'll know that it, I don't spend most of my time <laughs> outside of work, uh, working on projects. Because I do keep track. I can. You can do things while watching movies, you know. That makes the movie no, less I, good. I, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't multitask at all. Like if I'm watching a movie, I'm watching a movie. I'm not. But yeah, the, 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 I do keep track of all the movies I watch. So I know exactly how many hours I watch. So I could tell you. Okay. So one of your other major projects, as you mentioned, is weather station things. Yeah. What What do you do? I mean, I've read some of your blog posts, but... Andy brought it to the to the embedded party, which... Which was that's only... Right. Which was only a, like year, a year and, and a half, half ago. ago. Oh, no. D disturbingly enough. The second one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I feel like it was eight years ago, but no. It was. I feel like it was... Two weeks ago, like the past year has been a blur, oh, a year God. and a half. Feels like a blunt. century. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I brought my cheese boards to that one too. But but yeah, so 
how did I end up doing a weather station? Uh, that that I I found a different excuse to work on a project, and that excuse was my dad, because he's a nerd, just like me, and his father before him, and his father before him. We were all nerds, and my dad's family has a thing of they love measuring things, measuring everything. Like my, my grandpa had his own little rain gauge in the back of his house and he would measure every day and write down how much did it rain. He would write down temperatures. We would log the the car mileage every time you get service, the car service or you fuel up or anything. They would write down a little log book um, and that kind of thing. So I thought it'd be neat for my dad's birthday to build him a little weather station. And I could just buy him a weather station, but then I don't learn anything. So I was like, why don't I design a weather station and and give it to him for, for his birthday? So, so that's kind of how it started, like, I don't know, three years ago, I think. And again, it was an excuse to learn new technologies. So I, let me learn about radio stuff. So I, I started playing with Zigbee's. Uh, well, actually, so I should go back, and this will be relevant to what we were talking about earlier. I started this project, and I, I went and I got a, a little radio module, and I built kind of a sort of working weather station, but didn't start working. And then I just got tired of it and, and gave up and didn't touch the project for a year. <laughs> and then I realized that I, I the project suffered from premature optimization, <laughs> as a lot of people do where I try to get it ultra low power, ultra small, super efficient, everything all at once. And then it wasn't quite working and then I gave up. And so I realized like that's stupid. I need to do this better. And and I kind of gave myself a break and said, look, just build it as big as it has to be with as many wires and development boards, just get it working, make something work. And then once you have something working, start optimizing it, start making smaller, but always having something that works. And then you still have that kind of uh, shot of, of uh, joy <laughs> that you have something that works and, and, and then you can keep iterating and while still having something that, that's working. So, so, so then I started you know, making it smaller. I, I was using, I think, yeah, XP radios and an STM32 something and a big solar panel and a big battery. And I learned about weatherproofing because that, that was my excuse to like learn how, how do I make electronics to survive outside? How do I make solar? I've never done solar charging stuff. I've never done you know weather measuring besides temperatures and humidity inside fridges. And and yeah, so, so then I got it to my dad um, in Mexico and we put it on, on, on his roof in his house and then it, it would send the data to a Raspberry Pi and then the Raspberry Pi then has a web interface, and then you can see that. Um, and then over the following year, I started making it smaller. I switched from uh, from was it Zigbee to Bluetooth because uh, Bluetooth was long enough range. But then I switched now to LoRa, <laughs> and then I switched from NRF eighty two to SDM thirty two. And I've just been kind of making a smaller, lower power, different technologies, and and, and it's just an excuse again to, to learn all these different things. Laura versus BLE versus Zigbee. I mean, those all have really interesting <laughs> use cases, but they're not always the same use cases. They kind of are a spectrum. Right, yeah. What did you think of them? What would you use them for in the future? So the nice thing with the, the XB modules is that they just work. Um, they're not cheap. I mean, relative, like, you know, for, for one-offs is whatever, but um, they're... You do have kind of to set them up with their little um, GUI program, um, unless you want to read the data sheet. But but you basically just you can set them to do a mesh network. You can set them to do point to point or one to many, and and the radio just works. You can kind of do a, a serial bridge, if you will. So you just send data through your yard and then appears somewhere else, and and it's easy to use. So so that was really cool. Unfortunately, I think most of them now are 2.4 gigahertz, which is fine. Uh, it's just the, the range is not as much. They used to have a 900 megahertz one that would reach a little bit further. Then you have Bluetooth. And I think you're the most familiar with, with Bluetooth, and it's it's a nightmare. Because um, uh, for, for depending on what you want to do, if you want to talk to a phone, then yay. But if you're just <laughs> trying to communicate <laughs> between two devices... It's, uh, I feel like it's a little too much. It's a little um, over, over, like a lot of overhead. 
But the reason I wanted to use it is that the NRF52 is like pretty cheap. And then the NRF52811 and the NRF52840 supported the the uh, new uh, protocol. Uh, what was the? The BLE mesh one? No, not BLE mesh, but the, the long range one. The, it's a different kind of coding they do. Yeah, I don't remember what it's called. It's but it's basically Bluetooth, Bluetooth 5, but, but right. long range. So, so they actually drop the bit rate significantly. Right. Yeah and can get much further uh, uh, range. And it's still 2.4 gigahertz, but but they do like more for error correction, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then I was like, oh, that's really cool. I can use the same chips I've been doing and get much longer range. But I never actually got there. I just, because it was working well enough without, without trying to figure out. And also I, because Bluetooth's complicated and I didn't want to learn all of the, uh, uh, what, I've already forgot all the names, but you know you have to make your connection, and then you have the the things. I just do broadcast packets, so I just send advertisements with the data, and that's very easy to scan for advertisement <laughs> packets, and you don't have to actually make connections. Pretty, and that's that's, a, that's not. I mean, you're you're making fun of yourself, but that's that's that's. I mean, nothing wrong. That's with how that. the cheese sensors work too. They just send advertisements yeah. with like, hey, here's my like serial number and temperature and humidity and battery level. Like, do what what you want. And then I don't have to write in any fancy phone apps or anything. I just kind of scan for <laughs> scan for broadcast and, and and read it in. So so that's Bluetooth. And then LoRa is much much longer range, and it's a very different protocol. Again, it's not quite as cheap because uh, Semtech, the company that uh, basically has I don't know if it's a patent, so the, the rights to, to the actual encoding. Uh, any other company that wants to make LoRa radios has to license it from them. So there's a little bit of a tax on that but but the the protocol is designed to be very long range very low bandwidth but long range so which is kind of what the weather station is is, is great for and then you can do LoRa just point to point kind of what I was doing with with Bluetooth and with and with Zigbee but then the, there's LoRa WAN which is kind of the uh, an, a protocol on top of that which kind of you can send it straight to the internet if, if there's there's gateways all over the place, and then you don't need to have kind of your own uh, gateway because hmm. there's lots of public ones. Do you have your own gateway, or or do you use a a, a WAN point? Uh, right now, I'm doing it myself, just point to point because it's easier again. Um, I haven't. Pl- I do have a LoRa. It's called the Things Network, and it's kind of an open LoRa network. And then if you have your own gateway connects to their network, then you can, any of your devices can also use their network for free around the world. Um, now, Amazon snuck uh, LoRa gateways into everyone's houses with uh, Echoes. Excuse me, what? Yeah, uh, most Amazon Echoes have a LoRa gateway in them that they're turning on. Yeah, surprise. Uh, um, why? <laughs> why would Since they? Yeah, Amazon Sidewalk, I, Why would I think they do that? <laughs> for all of their Internet of Things I guess so. widgets for all around the house. I mean, Zigbee doesn't work that well around a house. Bluetooth... Except we have 700 Zigbee nodes in our house. Well, <laughs> yes. Yes, but they're not all on the same Hive and channel, so they are a pan-ID and channel, so they, they don't necessarily talk to each other. Mm-hmm. And Laura is a little nicer in that you can talk to strange devices and still expect things to get to where they're supposed to go. Yeah, if, if you're using Laura Wan, then then it, it'll route it to where it needs to get. But but yeah, so so it's called I think it's called Amazon Sidewalk, and I think what they're doing is they snuck like these gateways into everyone's houses, and then they're going to sell the service. So if you have any device or any connected device that you need to connect to a Laura network, then you can use Amazon's, and they're probably going to have global coverage already. Well, and since they're probably providing the back end where you can monitor, yeah. um, it's part of their AWS services. Yeah, okay. That makes uh, sense. AWS IoT or something. Yeah, AWS IoT. But yeah, if, if you're developing a gizmo, that's very convenient because then you don't have to worry about the other end. You can just make your device, make sure it speaks a lower WAN, and then register it with the Amazon network. And it'll work almost anywhere, hmm. which is, you know, convenient. You're not using that yet. Uh, no, not yet. 
Do you think you will? I, I I'm, I'm thinking about it. Uh, it's just, it's just more code. <laughs> I, I just have to spend the time to, to kind of uh, write the code or, or port the open source code to, to my device, and it's a little bit more testing. But, but that introduces more uh, uncertainty, just because, yeah, it, it's, it's now bidirectional communications. I'm not just transmitting out into the void and then hoping it gets there. I actually have to, you know, leave my device on for a bit, wait for response, or turn on every so often. And then the power consumption goes up uh, a lot. I don't want to say a lot more, but I have to do more profiling just to see how much is going to last. And again, it's not a huge deal. I can always put a bigger battery, but I'm, I'm very obsessive <laughs> with like, oh, I need it to be the most efficient. Okay, so cheese and weather <laughs> stations. Do you yes. have any other micro obsessions or, or plans? I thought for... you said microbe obsessions. Well, we did talk about cheese, so that's, so that's right. fair. Yeah. Um, do you have anything that you're starting or thinking about doing? Well, I did do over over the break <laughs> over the break <laughs> break. It's not a I don't break. Think that's what Jeez. people consider. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> while I was in vacation, uh, so while I was unemployed uh, last year, I, I found my I had for some reason I had my dad's. Uh, one of my dad's kind of lab reports from college for one of his digital systems classes. And he had made, this was like in the late 70s, he made a digital clock out of logic gate. So it's like a 555 timer as a clock source and some uh, counters and, and then uh, hex encoders or decoders, I guess. And so I found my dad's like notes and then I thought, hey, I have some of these logic gates. I should see if I can put this together. So I breadboarded the entire clock, and then I kind of uh, tweeted about it, which was fun, just as people kind of reminiscing. And then I thought, why don't I make a soldering kit out of this? So I made a, a circuit board w with my dad's original design, and then I sent him a soldering kit to put together, which was which was fun. Did he? Yeah. Did it work? Yeah, he's got a working clock uh, that he designed 40-some uh, years ago. <laughs> That's a great idea. That's just a great idea. Yeah, uh, but but uh, new new projects. I'm I, I'm trying not to. So so you always ask the start a dozen or finish one uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of thing, and I'm trying to finish these two before I take on any more ambitious things. I've been doing 3D printing stuff, just learning, and, and mostly as an excuse to make enclosures and and kind of things to hang other things in, <laughs> like for for storage. Um, I, I do have my obsessive storage system where I have all my components cataloged and labeled and databased, but that's a, that's a, that's another condition that I have. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, no, nothing, nothing new. I'm, I'm, I really do want to finish these and, and before I move on to something else, I have lots of ideas, but I don't, I want to talk to you at some point about uh, FreeCAD and stuff. Cause I've been doing, I haven't been doing much 3d printing, but I'll probably get back into it a little bit. And it's fun once the printer is working. I always have trouble with the CADs. Yeah. They just released FreeCAD uh, 19 finally, or well, 0 0.19. Uh, it was in beta for ever, but it's, it's pretty good. And I, I can, I can recommend some tutorials as well. Some good, pretty good YouTube videos. Cool. I, I did, um, uh, so Sophie Wong back, I don't know how many years ago, maybe two years ago, did a 30 days of Fusion 360 where she was modeling, uh, uh, doing a, a new 3D model in Fusion 360 every day uh, of the month. Oh, right. And you, I, I saw you doing something like that. So I did that for, her. well, th then Greg Davil, who's the wizard of the electronics, was doing one circuit board every day, which is Whoa. mental. And then that was also very inspiring. So, so I think in January or February, I decided to do a, a free cat model every day just for practice because that's the best way to learn is to do something. And then I put the ridiculous and arbitrary condition of I'm going to make a 3D model every day. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I did do that. How long did you spend on them? It was a question I meant to ask you while you were doing it, but I didn't. So like, is this three hours of homework or like a half an hour or, or what? It depended. I... I, I in some cases, it was less than half an hour when it's like, okay, it's 11 o'clock and I just want to get something out quick. And yeah, it'd be like half an hour, 25 minutes. But others, I did spend like a few hours because it was something useful that I sure. that I wanted to do. Sure. All right. 
but yeah, it, it, it was mostly the, the an excuse again to to practice. It just it's a uh, yeah, and, and, and that's a very arbitrary excuse, but you know it's something. I really like that idea of, of doing something every day, even if it's small, to keep you kind of engaged with the the skills yeah. that you're supposed to be learning. And and, and then you could just choose, yeah, to to do different uh, like. Even if it's not something useful, it's like maybe I'll use this different tool inside of or different right. uh, feature of the tool. Um, and, and at the beginning, because I am terrible at ideas, I did find this uh, one YouTuber who posted kind of 3D modeling challenges, if you will, like puzzles, where where he'll post the the mechanical drawing, like the the 2D drawing with dimensions, and then you just have to draw it uh, or uh, make it in CAD. And that was actually pretty helpful because it was some. You know some pieces uh, that that you know aren't super interesting if you just look at it, but but going from the drawing to the three D model uh, is kind of a different way of thinking. And also he designs them to kind of force you to use different parts of the tool, which was cool. Sweet. I like the hundred days of art, hundred days of code to get you into the habit. And the... one hundred. Ah, well, this those is just are, one month. Those were those are more general habit forming things. Where oh, yeah. 30 days of free CAD is more learning a tool all the way down and not learning the first 10 minutes 30 times as you do it over a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and if you're trying to solve problems, you're, you're exactly. Yeah. There's a necessity to find, oh, this, I cannot do this with my first 10 minutes of knowledge. What's the other tool I need, right? And, and if you have a 3D printer, you can actually print stuff and, and kind of hold that thing you made, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was a couple that I took several days to do. So, so I did a 3d model of my headphones. So one day I just did kind of the, the, the arc, the, the cups. And, and then the other day I did the, the headband and, and that still counted because I still modeled <laughs> every day. Well, it's been wonderful to talk to you and thank you very much for, um, standing in for a guest who couldn't make it. I really appreciate Anytime. the, the, Hey, I need help. And you saying, okay. <laughs> do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with uh yay have some cheese <laughs> cheese uh, will make you happy unless you're lactose intolerant don't have cheese um <laughs> please i mean and there's then, still some lactose intolerant people who still like cheese and we'll oh yeah no but the people around them don't appreciate it usually <laughs> uh that's what i've heard you know i uh, <laughs> no but but just just with uh with 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 projects uh uh the biggest l- lesson i learned from the weather station one was just get something working. Don't get fancy at first um, because you might get discouraged early. So just get something working, even if it's not elegant, even if it's kind of unwieldy or hacked together. Once it's working, you'll be happy you got something working and then you can build up from there. I'm so glad we didn't have to end the show on flatulence jokes. Nobody said anything about flatulence. It was implied. Our well, now we have. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest has been Alvaro Prieto, electrical engineer, firmware engineer, maker, traveler, and co-host of the unnamed Reverse Engineering Show. And Cheesemonger. Oh, and Cheesemonger. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thanks, Alvaro. <laughs> oh, no problem. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. Thank you for listening. And... Oh, I do have a quote here. I do have... Oh, if you want to contact us, show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on Embedded FM. My quote is from Patrick Rothfuss from his book, The Wise Man's Fear. I was one of those. I meddled with dark powers. I summoned demons. I ate the entire little cheese, including the rind. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 